Welcome to this special uh, plenary lecture, absolutely on mental health uh, conversations between Audrey Khan and Pierre Briel. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Kazutaka Ikeda, the CNP treasurer. I'm greatly honored to serve as the chair of this session. This session consists of two parts. The first part is the conversations between Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tan, and CNP president, Pierre Briel. This is surely a commemorative uh, conversation between a genius and a neuropsychopharmacology, neuropsychopharmacology leader. The second part is Q&A. Uh, CNP president-elect, Joseph Zohal, CNP ISPC vice chair, Noriko Osumi, CNP councillor elect and TSBP and President Yame Bai, CNP councillor and CNP treasurer elect Min Chi Huan and Dr. Uh, Mu Hong Chen. The coordinator of this session will ask questions and Minister Tan will uh, kindly answer them, please. And so I would like to briefly introduce Minister Audrey Tan to you, uh, since I think most of you already know her glorious and unique career. Minister Tan was a prodigy, as you know. She learned advanced mathematics before six years old and started programming before eight years old. Before 20 years old, she worked uh, in California's Silicon Valley as an entrepreneur. She also served as a consultant at Apple Incorporation. She served as the consultant for the Taiwan government in 2014 and was appointed as a minister in 2016 when she was uh, six, when she was 35 years old. And her sophisticated countermeasures against the COVID-19 pandemic and the development of tools for civil societies such as Gov0 are famous all over the world. I'd also like to introduce our CNP president, Pierre Briel. Uh, professor Pierre Briel is a full professor at the University of Ottawa Department of Psychiatry and Cellular Molecular Medicine, and the recipient of the Endo Chair in Mood Disorder Research at the Royal Institute on Mental Health Research, IMHR. He was elected as CNP president-elect in 2018 and installed as president in 2021. This CNP World Congress is his last and most important mission as CNP president. As one of the audiences of this special session, I'm very much looking forward to the conversations between Minister Tan and CNP President Briel. So could you start the conversation? Thank you, Minister uh, Tang, for accepting our uh, invitation for this uh, session, which will be a plenary lecture in our World Congress of Neuropsychopharmacology. Uh, you certainly came uh, highly recommended by uh, many clinicians and scientists in, in Taiwan for this uh, lecture or conversation. So as digital minister in charge of social uh, innovation, uh, it will be my pleasure to touch upon all the contributions you've made to uh, Taiwan uh, over the more recent years. However, I uh, really have to start by uh, asking you a little bit to elaborate on your uh, upbringing and your really unorthodox uh, training as a, as a professional. So I read in your CV that uh, both your parents uh, were educators and uh, helped uh, co-develop uh, an experimentary primary school. And uh, as Professor Ikeda mentioned, uh, you started uh, making uh, great steps uh, early in life. So. Can I ask you at this uh, young and tender age of four to six, what was the influence of your parents on your achievements? Thank you. I am really honored to be here and good local time, everyone. Uh, one of my earliest memories uh, before my parents turned into educators, they were first journalists and they were working in the martial law uh, era, Taiwan, where they had to consistently uh, work toward the democratization 
of Taiwan. So my earliest experiences was uh, talking with them about what democracy actually means, what does this new party, uh, somewhat illegally fo formed, the Democratic Progressive Party, what does progress uh, actually mean, and so on. So there's a lot of debate uh, that's based on real life uh, in the dinner tables of our family. Uh, and uh, when I turned eight, I encountered this computer thing, uh, and I started to apply whatever I learned from those conversations uh, so that we can program uh, like a instrument, uh, a kind of space where a different kind of interaction may appear. So uh, when I encountered the internet when I was 12, that was 1990. Uh, I immediately um, launched uh, a few projects of my own and co-founding some companies with other people. So I dropped out of the middle high school when I was 14 uh, with the full blessing of the head of the school because I said, you know, knowledge is being created there and I really don't have to uh, earn a PhD or whatever other diploma in order to contribute to science. So this is a, an amazing uh, start to your professional career. So I was wondering, uh, siblings, and if your parents were focusing solely on your uh, education or uh, if you had uh, other family members with you. Yeah, um, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning, my parents uh, did start, mostly my mom, uh, did work on uh, the founding the sibling. Uh, primary school, which is the experimental primary school. Uh, but just for the record, I was not uh, a student at the school. I was an advisor to the school. And among the students in the school was uh, my younger brother, uh, four years younger. But also many other kids uh, studied uh, in my mother's school uh, with the support from my father and many other friends. Uh, but uh, personally, I would go on and be educated mostly by the Wild Web uh, community online. Thank you. And so when you decided to leave junior high school, how was the, uh, what was the reaction of the principal or the school to your uh, project? As I mentioned, uh, it was full blessing. Um, I remember printing out the email uh, of my exchange uh, with the Cornell University's website archive, A-R-X-I-V, which is still around after all these years, uh, where people post their preprints. And because across the internet, nobody knew I was just 14 years old and my English was not really not there. Uh, I had to um, look at the dictionary for hours before finishing my first email, uh, but that's all fine. Uh, people just wrote back and then we start very quickly collaborating on papers and so on. I remember telling the head of the school, uh, you told me that I have to spend decades, right, to be a postdoc or something to work with professors. Um, but nowadays, I'm just working with professors immediately. And after looking at it, thinking for a minute or so, the head of school, Du Huiping, simply said, okay, from tomorrow, you don't have, have to go to my school anymore. Well, that's, that's amazing. And uh, I also read in your CV that you, in, in that period, that you spent some time in, in Germany. So uh, that must have been uh, another culture shock for you. How did that go? And how did you do with the yet another language to learn? Yeah, just I'm Bissian. I don't speak uh, German that much anymore, uh, but I do uh, read it. Back in uh, when I was 11, I attended the primary school uh, in Germany uh, in I think it was near the Sachbrücken, so in, in Dudweiler, a pretty small town. And I found out that 10 years old, who are my classmates, were even more mature, much more mature, actually, than the 12 years old, uh, who used to be my classmates a year prior because I jumped two grades uh, the, the previous year. So the um, 10 years old in Germany are like five years more senior than the 12 years old uh, in Taiwan. And I wondered why, and I very quickly found this idea of Pygmalion effect, where if the adults treat the younger kids as fellow adults, uh, then they learn to schedule themselves to, to behave like an adult and vice versa. And so w when did you uh, actually move back to, uh, to Taiwan? Uh, so it or... was just for a year, so I moved back uh, in okay. when I turned 12. Yeah. 
Okay. And then uh, you, you also work uh, at the Silicon uh, Valley. So later on in uh, in your adolescence, still uh, you you were president of a of a firm called uh, Our Internet. So can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit what you did in in that mm -hmm. position? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Sure. So um, that was actually my second or third uh, foray into founding startups. The first startup that I co-founded was when I was 15 uh, in 1996. Uh, that was called Inforian. Uh, and uh, our internet was the company after that. In both of the companies, uh, we've worked uh, with the so-called uh, free software or later on open source community, working to um, basically convince the software integration vendors uh, to switch from a proprietary model where people hold the copyright, the patents, the trade secrets uh, for all the software that we write into this open source model where we share the parts that are reusable across the industry. Uh, and so I'm part of this free software and open source movement. Uh, and mostly our internet is there to make sure that the open source adopters receive the same kind of support that they uh, receive from the proprietary vendors. Okay, so uh, can you tell us a, a, a little bit uh, about uh, how you uh, actually uh, got to the government? So I don't know how the government works in, in Taiwan. So if you're in the uh, government as a, as a minister, I suppose you had to take some, uh, some first steps before uh, yeah. joining the, the government. Is it by election or how, mm -hmm. how does it work? Or how did it work for you? Uh, well, we literally invited ourselves in when we occupied the parliament uh, peacefully in 2014, March. That's part of the Sunflower Movement. And uh, through three weeks of nonviolent action, uh, we worked with half a million people on the street and many more online uh, to deliberate the cross-strait service and trade agreement with Beijing. And so at the end of 2014, uh, the cabinet simply hired us, I guess, the occupiers and the facilitators as reverse mentors, people younger than 35, who nevertheless uh, advises cabinet members. So I became a kind of intern of sorts, consultant of sorts, for a couple of years. And after two years in 2016, I got promoted literally in the same office uh, from a reverse mentor into a full minister. So I'm sure the uh, the audience will be uh, eager to hear uh, your opinion on the computational uh, psychiatry in the in the societies and information technology and uh, and usually you know that uh, can cause some uh, some an some anxiety and uh, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit uh, of your efforts in uh, computational mm -hmm. psychiatry? Mm -hmm. But the, the sort of anxiety that we encountered during this recording was also my experience uh, when I first uh, encountered this idea of psychoanalysis over the internet uh, back in 2010 uh, or so. Um, you see, I uh, worked with um, a psychoanalyst in France uh, who insisted that we still meet face to face uh, for a week or two weeks uh, from time to time, but mostly uh, we work across time zones. Uh, and so it, it became very uh, uh, quickly apparent that it's no longer the psych psychiatrist or psychoanalyst and the case anymore. Um, essentially, there's three uh, players, three agents uh, in the room. Uh, where the computer, the intermediary, uh, plays this role of a weather, so to speak, because we're not in the same time zone. Um, it's impossible to break the eyes and open up the conversation to talk about something shared, like it's cold or it's hot, because it's not shared. Uh, but connection quality uh, and the microphone settings and everything like that become a kind of substitute for weather uh, that we can nevertheless uh, talk about. So I think my approach uh, to this is always to build small but clear um, 
success stories. That is to say, making sure that all the information technology that we design uh, go to where people are instead of asking people to come to technology. So if they prefer uh, pen and paper, then we uh, should work on the uh, technology that lets the people just fill in the form with pen and paper and put into a nearby post box. And then we um, employ optical recognition um, technologies and so on. So it still streamlines the processing, but it does not put undue burden uh, for people to switch to a different kind of norm, a different kind of habit. So I firmly believe that technology should go to where people are in order to reduce the anxiety. Most of the anxiety comes from uh, where people uh, think that technology are leaving them behind. They have to adapt to where the technologists are. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm still a bit puzzled when you said you uh... Uh, consulted or you exchange with the uh, psychoanalyst in 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 mm -hmm. France uh, what were you uh, really uh, try to get out of that uh, interaction mm -hmm. well insights I guess uh, isn't that what uh, the psychological conversations is about to to me uh, after more than five years uh, working with psychoanalysts I would say that the main thing that I gained uh, was this mental space in which that I can see whatever I'm um, encountering now from the perspective of an internalized uh, iPad that has uh, the psychoanalyst on it. So uh, it allowed me to be more in the moment instead of being caught into whatever passion or whatever situation in there, I would be able to contain uh, those different experiences from a much more calm uh, perspective. Okay, but with uh, w without having this uh, uh, in-person connection, aren't you uh, afraid that, uh, you know, some emotions may not be uh, passed on adequately, or mm -hmm. maybe that very important cues would be mm -hmm. missed, and that's that's one of the mm -hmm. problems that uh, we've uh, we faced in the during the pandemic uh, initially. For example, mm -hmm. I was very uncomfortable. Uh, talking to my patients, even though I knew them well, mm -hmm. just uh, first over the phone mm -hmm. and then even uh, over Zoom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, a, a bad quality connection is even worse than no connection because if the um, image is blurry, the gestalt, the, the psychological projections uh, take place automatically, even for trained professionals. And we would fill in uh, our best guesses uh, on what's actually happening out there, which may be completely off the mark, right? So uh, a lot of work uh, that I've been doing uh, through the video psychoanalysis is indeed to ensure at least the sound pods enjoy a low latency, meaning a very short delay, and high bandwidth, meaning that the nonverbal cues are transmitted accurately and the videos uh, is really not that important because uh, when I'm on the couch I'm not even looking at the videos uh, except from time to time anyway and so we optimize uh, for the audio connection and the video is just there uh, to basically remind each other that we're still there. Okay so so you feel that uh, even uh, connecting like this uh, remotely uh, people can really interact at a significant uh, emotional level Yeah but what one has to uh, switch to uh, a audio only mode like listening to podcasts and things like that which may be more conductive uh, to free association anyway right when we close our eyes it's easier to enter a reverie uh, but if you open your eyes it's quite clear that the two-dimensional piece of glass is not even for the highest resolution it's not a person okay so so you feel that uh, this will uh, improve the uh, mental care, mental health care in, uh, in, in general. Uh, but uh, what do you think of these uh, application, these apps where uh, people uh, report their, their condition or their, their status, uh, mm -hmm. even on yeah, a frequent mm -hmm. basis? Do you mm -hmm. think that mm -hmm. 
could be too invasive up to a certain point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, from 2010 to 2016, I worked with uh, a team called Siri uh, within Apple uh, right after they acquired uh, that piece of technology. Uh, and we've seen many people uh, talking to Siri um, similar to how I would talk to my psychoanalyst, <clears throat> that is to say, share whatever uh, they're feeling uh, at the moment. So uh, if the interaction uh, feels safe, if people feel that um, Siri is coming to where they are instead of asking them to do extra things, then I do believe uh, that puts a little bit more agency and more uh, in the momentness, the more control uh, to the person. But if on the other hand, a person has reasons to believe uh, that they have to conform to a certain format uh, or that technology is not working for their best interest but for advertisers' best interest or that is over-centralizing its data store so that state surveillance uh, may enter the picture and so on, then I do believe it would have the adverse effect of inhibiting uh, the free sharing of whatever in the moment that's, that they're uh, be experiencing. Okay, well, uh, well, I suppose that this type of, of approach would be uh, good for somebody who's technology uh, savvy, but uh, mm -hmm. some patients may not be sa technology savvy or, for example, mm -hmm. in, in mood disorders, uh, when patients are showing a high level of uh, anhedonia and they are really withdrawn, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, would you be afraid that this mode of exchanges would be hampered. And the thing about the intermediated uh, connection is that it allows for many retries, many rehearsals, if you will. Um, just like the recording we're doing now is not being live streams. So it allows many retakes of such conversations. So in a sense, uh, a conversation with Siri or any uh, specialized assistance uh, residing simply on the personal device of the case of the patient, uh, I believe that serves as kind of a, a training wheel uh, before they have um, the um, appropriate uh, readiness uh, for more in-person connections. But I'm not pretending that it's all um, good things, right? Uh, it could also be possible that they become even more withdrawn if the kind of reactions they got from those personalized technologies uh, track them into uh, conspiracy theories, into polarized bubbles, uh, into self-harm communities and things like that. So it's uh, well within, I think, the, not just the ethics, but the practicalities of the design of such personal assistance to make sure that we steer uh, the conversation toward eventually opening up and um, have the access to peer counseling or to professional counseling and things like that. A lot of people uh, working in the Siri team is very much well aware uh, of this dynamic. Okay. Well, uh, in, in the context of the, of the pandemic, uh, uh, I, we, we are, I think, all concerned about uh, you know, children uh, learning social skills and, and uh, having uh, interactions. So if, if people can, uh, can withdraw to this type of, uh, of communication, like being on the net, uh, uh, do you think it could be uh, you know, counter, counterproductive? Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, and which is why Taiwan countered the pandemic uh, for two and a half years now with not a single day of lockdown. But we never uh, banned free movement uh, for people. We never uh, said that the children is not free to visit uh, their fellow uh, schoolmates and other family members and so on, uh, precisely because um, even though we understand that this kind of at distance communication works best uh, in a kind of knowledge exchange mode, like we're talking about um, some shared knowledge uh, right now and like my conversation with professors on archive and so on, um, for the socialization, for the um, becoming uh, a social being, um, it's, it's no substitute for face-to-face -face communication. So uh, in Taiwan, our counter-pandemic measures, just like uh, we counter the infodemic with no takedowns, because we know takedowns, especially state administrative takedowns, will inhibit 
people's uh, capability of digital competence, of uh, media competence, of uh, making judgment by themselves. Uh, so would the lockdown inhibit the socialization process, which is why we put a high emphasis on countering with no lockdowns. Okay, well, uh, while we're talking about this, you know, for the benefit of our uh, international uh, audience, uh, I have mm -hmm. to say personally, I, I don't know how things uh, rolled out in uh, in Taiwan mm -hmm. during the mm -hmm. pandemic, but uh, you're touching upon, uh, I think, a very uh, unique approach that uh, has been mm -hmm. taken in Taiwan. Can, so, for example, uh, you said there were no uh, absolute mm -hmm. lockdowns. And mm -hmm. while we were talking about children, so were the children still going to school and under mm -hmm. what conditions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the children are all going to school uh, physically, except, I believe, uh, when there are community outbreak uh, in their school. Uh, but even so, uh, the people, the children who have no access to the uh, internet, tablets, and so on in their homes, um, they either get a, a free tablet, which we are rolling out uh, later this year uh, from the school, or they simply go to the school, uh, but attend in the telecommunication courses. But for the vast majority of time during the past two year and a half, because so far Taiwan in a jurisdiction with 24 million people, uh, at the moment uh, around just 1,000 people uh, died of COVID. So it's a relatively uh, low impact compared to other jurisdictions. So for most of the time, uh, the stu students simply go to school physically. Oh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that, that's quite uh, impressive. So only about 1,000 uh, deaths. And so were your uh, uh, hospital system overwhelmed actually by the cases? Mm -hmm. Not uh, from my knowledge. Uh, I mean, uh, for most of the pandemic times, we put the uh, ideas of uh, hand sanitation, uh, mask wearing, uh, physical distance, as well as uh, a strong uh, border quarantine, uh, contact tracing, and so on uh, into the forefront because we took action on the first day of 2020 that allowed for in that year more than eight months uh, without a single case locally. Uh, and even after the Alpha and Delta and the Omicron um, outbreaks so far, our hospitals uh, are not overwhelmed. That, that's, uh, that, that's really uh, remarkable. And so how did you personally, uh, you know, uh, live through this or still living through this, uh, this mm -hmm. crisis, uh, you know, having to, to wear a mask and uh, mm -hmm. interacting with your, with your colleagues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I, uh, I was the first teleworking minister back in 2016, uh, so in a sense we're, we're ready for this, and I much prefer actually a high resolution uh, maskless conversation over the internet uh, over a masked conversation um, face to face. Uh, to me, I think the uh, high resolution conversation as we're having now is far more preferable because the um, nonverbal expressions can be transmitted as opposed to uh, over the mask. And I believe uh, many people uh, in our government, uh, that was their first uh, foreign really into a fully intermediate conversation online and soon they discover even when we don't have lockdown anymore when the free travel is allowed and so on um, they spend time face to face to build uh, rapport, to build personal support and connections but afterwards they are much more comfortable uh, in meeting uh, over the internet so our digital transformation I think proceeded quite smoothly uh, over the past year and this year in 2020 there was no behavior change after all because as I mentioned um, many, many months without a single local case. So our transformation began a year or so uh, later compared to other jurisdictions around the world. But uh, it's also fortunate, I guess, because it doesn't feel forced. It feels that it's hybrid all along and people just choose the best interaction mode that fits their purpose. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If uh... If people are interacting, for example, on a, on a camera, they don't have a mask over your face. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess for children, they're per perhaps uh, learning to to read people's uh, emotions. So that would be mm -hmm. 
favorable, but uh, what about uh, attention span then when you're using these devices? Because when we sit in the in the conference like the the CINP, so we can uh, listen to lectures and for uh, for hours and take only short breaks but uh, having to mm -hmm. to communicate for many many uh, hours during the day uh, i find myself uh, and my colleagues mm -hmm. get uh, fatigued and we we just mm -hmm. cannot uh, sustain the attention for that long of mm -hmm. a period yeah and and it's uh i think for most people when they look into the camera and they don't see a uh, other people's face and when they look other people's face mm -hmm. then they're not looking at the camera anymore that that really is quite jarring uh and of course there are ways around that like setting up a teleprompter in front of the screen but that's a very professional setup and i would say most people uh, would not uh like to uh, adapt to technology that much, uh, which is why I stress that for most of the uh, conferences and the events that we hold, we emphasize not on the face-to-face -face part. The face-to-face -face part maybe runs for 15 minutes, for 20 minutes, and that's it. And afterward, people are just uh, voice uh, avatars. Maybe we go on Getter Town or some other avatar uh, places uh, where people don't have to spend their time on their eyes that much anymore, but they still have a vague uh, sense of what, which people are nearby, what's the proximity, but mostly then we rely on sound. And I found that uh, then I can easily sustain uh, three hours, four hours with no trouble. But if I have to stare at a two-dimensional real-time image uh, of a view uh, for two hours, then the fatigue sets in very quickly. Hmm. So, um... Actually, I was uh, uh, reading here uh, mm -hmm. metaverse, so I I didn't even mm -hmm. know what what it is. So I had to mm -hmm. to look it up, and so this is uh, something that you are using, or mm -hmm. maybe you can define it for some of our audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. if if that's part of your assessment mm -hmm. and the follow up mm -hmm. of of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so I, I call the uh, technology that we're using shared realities. I don't particularly call it metaverse for reason uh, why I don't call uh, searching on the internet Googling, uh, right? I am not endorsing any particular brand. Uh, but, but in shared realities, um, what, what my definition is that people feel comfortable sharing what they're experiencing now, the as atmosphere, the ambience, the everything around them, to people in different places uh, at the same time, right? So it's something about sharing our ambience to the other side of the world. Now, this is a, a powerful concept because then it enables what we call co-presence, meaning that people feel they are in the same room, even though physically they are not. Uh, but this is in a position to, for example, uh, people having to conform uh, to a particular kind of arrangement, like playing a video game, uh, obeying those video games rules, and so on. It's not about yielding control to the video game operator, but rather that anyone can host a, a, as a local host, whatever they're experiencing uh, throughout different time zones to other places, but still a local host. So they can still define the interaction rules, the safe uh, spaces, the interaction patterns, the bubbles and things like that, uh, like a real host uh, in their home would. Okay. And in using this, uh, this technology, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, some people may be concerned about uh, privacy issues because, of mm -hmm. course, in mental health, this is uh, very mm -hmm. important and it can mm -hmm. prevent people from uh, interacting and, and engaging. So mm -hmm. uh, what type of measures are implemented mm -hmm. to, to ensure that there is no mm -hmm. confidentiality break? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, a local host means that uh, the computational uh, support is entirely provided uh, by the persons involved in, and which we call end-to-end, -end, from your end 
to my end, and it's fully encrypted so that people in the middle uh, could not eavesdrop or they could not alter uh, our presentations to each other and so on. Uh, and this end-to-end -end principle encompasses not just encryption, which is confidentiality of things, but also uh, discovery. Instead of having to go through an intermediary, like looking up your Facebook account, it should be possible for uh, the both of us to connect without the third um, party uh, introducing us to one another. We could be uh, just um, exchanging on a physical conference or sending an email or things like that. And email, by the way, is fully federated. It's not like we have to all use the same email provider. And if we do not uh, honor this end-to-end -end, um, principle, then it would be like we'll be forced to do our psychiatry sessions uh, on Facebook, which is uh, like a nightclub in the entertainment district. So where, while we're talking about uh, uh, us, uh, it will be very loud music, it will be addictive drinks and advertisement being served, private bouncers uh, escorting you out if you say something inappropriate, uh, and after all, not a mentally uh, sound place, especially for young people uh, to be in. Now, I'm not against the entertainment sector or nightclubs in general. I'm just saying in the digital realm, there should be things other than these sort of places for the conversations that we're having. Mm -hmm. So that's with respect to uh, privacy, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. what about uh, safety and mental health, for example, if as mm -hmm. a, a therapist you are really concerned about mm -hmm. the, the safety of your patient, uh, mm -hmm. if, if they are uh, remote, that can uh, cause some issues. So, for example, when we start our, uh, our um, interactions with our patient, we ask them where they are mm -hmm. and but you can't be sure about that. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. patients can, could be lying to us. And if there's an issue that comes in, for example, with respect to suicidal ideation, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, safeguards would, could we be applying to ensure safety mm -hmm. of, our, of our patients? Uh, I think just like there are communities uh, for self-harm on the internet, there's also peer counseling communities that had experiences in self-harm but uh, have ways to mitigate against it in their own experience. So it's double-sided, right? If someone can find a local peer counseling community that lives nearby that supports each other, then it strengthens uh, the local resilience whenever something uh, unfortunate happens as you mentioned, and then the psychiatrist will be working with uh, the entire community, not just with uh, a single case. But if, on the other hand, their internet connections to their peer communities, uh, the psychiatrist is not aware of and therefore cannot leverage uh, these community supports, then it's really at a disadvantage uh, when the patients are remote. Hmm. So. How, how can we uh, ensure, uh, for example, just using uh, remote devices like that, how can we ensure, say, uh, true compliance with the treatment, whether, you know, if you're trying to apply some uh, cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy or mm -hmm. uh, how, how can we, how can mm -hmm. we be sure that the, the treatment we're implementing mm -hmm. uh, is actually mm -hmm. uh, taking place? Yeah, this is a question being asked by all the primary school teachers <clears throat> who had to assign homeworks uh, over the internet. How, how do you know it's not their parents doing their homework or filling their examinations, right? Uh, and, and the answer is you, you can't. Uh, over the internet, there really is no way to prevent a parent uh, from filling in their students, uh, their children's homework, uh, or doing the examination on their behalf. I mean, there are expensive apparatus you can try to install, but many parents are also technological experts, and it's their home. They can circumvent it very easily. So uh, I think uh, as part of going back to the experimental education uh, that we talked about in the very beginning, 
the, the core idea of the Sidling uh, Primary School that my mom uh, helped co-found, and later on we took those ideas into our uh, core curriculum for Taiwan's basic education, uh, is that the, the student need to own uh, their learning process. We admit that really there's no technologically feasible way uh, for them to comply <laughs> with any top-down assignments, so they need to find the peer support, the people who are actually close to them and who see that education is not just about completing homeworks, but about uh, ways to learn uh, with each other and from each other. So learning circles that involves the parents, uh, the ways that the teachers explains the curriculum first to the parents so that the parents can coach the students instead of feeling in their exams and so on, are the um, educational pedagogical uh, changes that we've been putting into place. And we call it uh, competence instead of um, literacy. Uh, education because uh, through examination tick boxes you can check literacy but you can't check competence competence you have to actually do the homework as work uh, uh, finishing the lab assignments together and so on but there's no standard answer in any of that so the parents need to work with the students and the student need to work with themselves on that and no individual to individual competition is possible so if pedagogy uh, is changing uh, due to this kind of communication. I, I do think that some of our um, communication modes in the psychiatry field need also to adapt similarly. So uh, you've obviously done uh, a lot of work and uh, uh, you know we always say uh, in in hindsight the uh, vision is always 2020. So mm -hmm. during this uh, pandemic uh, with respect to your efforts uh, in helping with the mental health and maintaining communication, uh, mm -hmm. do you feel that you there are some things that you could have done better or maybe you would mm -hmm. not have done and maybe mm -hmm. have taken uh, another approach? So uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, what you personally have, have you learned uh, throughout mm -hmm. this pandemic? Because everybody... We didn't know what was hitting us, and then uh, we didn't know how to manage a lot of medical and psychiatric uh, conditions. Mm -hmm. So anything you yeah. would have done different that you could apply in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So in Taiwan, um, not just citizens, but residents also have access to universal health care, uh, including um, psychological counseling, mental care, and also dentist uh, care, uh, very affordable. Uh, so we're kind of uh, dependent uh, on the IC card, uh, that is our universal health card, which proved its importance back in 2003 when SARS first hit Taiwan, people were still using paper-based uh, health record cards, except for a small island called Penghu, which are already experimenting with IC cards. Uh, and paper-based uh, workflow simply doesn't work uh, during the time where people have to quarantine a lot. Uh, but the IC card is not uh, a, a panacea either, uh, because when people are across the cameras and so on, uh, just simply configuring the card reader over a camera is a headache for a lot of people. Uh, this year, uh, we've opened up fully a QR code based uh, health card that anyone can install on their phones. And for the very old people or very young people, their family can also uh, act on their behalf by proxy, uh, so that people can just simply show the QR code to the camera and the doctor on the other side just scan that QR code and that finishes uh, all the universal healthcare transactions, including access uh, to the records of pharmacology and uh, diagnosis and things like that, X-ray scans and so on. Um, and to, truth to be told, that technology was ready, um, I think in 2019, uh, but we simply did not roll it out uh, across the country, simply because Taiwan is relatively small and there's simply no need uh, for this kind of telemedicine, except in very remote islands or in the indigenous areas. So with 
perfect hindsight, uh, I think back in 2019, we should have scaled the virtual QR code based health card uh, mandating uh, its training and use for all the clinicians and psychological counseling and things like that. Uh, but we, we didn't, right? So it took us a couple years before we're now comfortable uh, with issuing those QR code based universal health cards, uh, even for people who uh, don't have the time to take a photo of themselves because it used to be a photo ID. Uh, we're now opening up for everyone, but that should take place before the pandemic. Okay, so that that's that's a that's a great system. But and you're said uh, it's uh, safe proof in the sense that uh, people cannot act uh, hack. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the uh, the right. system yes. and get get access to this all this uh, information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the universal health care system hosted yes. by the National Health uh, Insurance Administration uh, had no uh, cybersecurity incident of the kind you described, um, I think, ever. Yeah. Well, that's that, that that's really good. And also, if uh, if so, for example, a, a different uh, treating physician is trying to access uh, somebody's mm -hmm. uh, uh, somebody's uh, file uh, that that would be flagged in the system. Uh, yeah, because they also have to use their own card or, or their uh, hospital institution's virtual card uh, in that uh, record. So it's mutual accountability with the app that I described, the National Health Insurance Express app. Uh, anyone can see uh, which clinics, which doctors have uh, prescribed this or have looked at uh, your information for this purpose and things like that. So aside from statistics use, uh, which um, people may or may not be able to opt out. It's still in the constitutional court. But aside from statistical research purpose, the individual to individual transactions, uh, their full record is made available to the patient. So if they're misdiagnosed or if they just simply want to ask uh, which doctor access this file for which purpose and so on, there's this full ledger that's shared by all the uh, insurance participants in the universal health system. So, for example, if somebody wanted to uh, consult mm -hmm. your medical file without your approval, mm -hmm. you would be made aware mm -hmm. of that as a QR holder, as a patient yourself. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. You can ask the NHI app for that sort of record. But even more importantly, we apply that even for the contact tracing. So during the time uh, for a year or so when we're doing venue-based contact tracing, you can scan the QR code, check into the venue, but that stays in your local telecom. It doesn't transmit to the contact tracer, the public health professionals. And when they look into this record, you are made aware on a dedicated website and you can then ask them uh, for account. Okay. Well, may maybe uh, one, one final point. Uh... And now taking the perspective of the of the clinician, uh, one of the problems that uh, that we have here and that all the physicians are are complaining about is uh, having to use a, an electronic medical record uh, mm -hmm. is very time consuming and mm -hmm. not always designed by uh, people who are clinic cl clinically mm -hmm. savvy. And then we end up spending sometimes more time with the EMR system. Uh, mm -hmm. than with the patient, whether it's face-to-face uh, mm -hmm. -face or uh, by, uh, by the internet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yes. uh, how much, so, so how much feedback do you actually get when mm -hmm. you devise these systems from, from clinicians who, have their, mm -hmm. who are in the trenches? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think empowering people closest to the pain, uh, especially people in the trenches, uh, is uh, very important. Uh, instead of the central government designing all the interfaces, uh, we've endorsed the idea of an open API. API is a machine-to-machine -machine interface. So as long as the structural data is written into the universal healthcare system in some way, we don't actually care what sort of software that the clinician side uses uh, to produce such structured data. So there are people in Taiwan, for example, uh, working with uh, machine learning experts. So they can simply uh, speak their diagnosis uh, and into the system and the system will automatically highlight the keywords, uh, guess the labels, guess the diagnosis uh, uh, codes and so on. Of course, uh, you have 
to still uh, check it before hitting enter because after you hit all, uh, the, the patients will hold you, not the machine to account. Uh, but the machine, the um, what I call assistive intelligence, uh, do help a lot in streamlining the experience of filling the forms and so on. So opening up these APIs so that you can work with your preferred software vendor to design such assistive intelligences, I believe that's very important. So maybe one question with respect to uh, access in your in your system. Uh, so uh, patients uh, consult, say, a family physician, then they can be referred. But do they have uh, access uh, to physicians mm -hmm. or psychiatrists uh, with uh, relative ease without uh, facing months of delays, despite this mm -hmm. uh, this technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of psychiatrists uh, are now working with the virtualized uh, national health system for the first time. So at this very moment, there are some delays simply because you're not that experienced uh, with the system. Uh, just like when the uh, last year, when the classroom teachers have to adapt to the online uh, courses, it take them, took them, I think, three weeks or so uh, before they fully familiarize uh, with the environment. But I think um, that's, um, that's worth uh, learning. Uh, and I believe that after a month or so, after the psychiatrists in Taiwan uh, learned about this virtual counseling um, apparatus of the national healthcare, uh, this current um, um, gem <laughs> will be resolved in due time, just like we resolved that uh, last year during the classrooms uh, switch to the online education. So, so there, there is no uh, uh, problem, big problem with access to uh, to uh, to a physician or or a psychiatrist in in Taiwan, because uh, that's the problem we have here in the, in our area. So it's a socialized medicine that we have, but the access is is sometimes limited. Yeah, I think that and then has the, everything the, to yes. Yeah, please. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yes, and and I was and, and I was just gonna add. So who who actually is the quarterback or the health care professional who who manages, uh, say, a, a patient with a, with a given problem? So is it always a physician? Uh, a social worker, a psychologist, uh, or uh, mm -hmm. you know, a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it varies. Um, I think in in my personal case, uh, I was, I think, diagnosed. Uh, 2005 uh, as gender identity disorder, which uh, according to the latest ICD, it's not even a disorder anymore, right? It's incongruence nowadays. But back in the days, um, that that was uh, by professional uh, doctors uh, in um, the uh, large hospitals. Uh, and I went there uh, simply because I know that they will be able to refer me to the local counselors, to uh, the helpers and the peer counseling community, uh, people in the LGBTIQA plus community that will be able uh, to basically um, lower the kind of anxiety uh, that everybody around me feels. I don't personally feel that much, but people around me do, uh, and so on. So all these, I think, uh, are there, but uh, we still rely on the primary diagnosis uh, from the National Health Insurance System by a professional doctor as kind of the first uh, step. And I don't think that changed a lot uh, during the past 15 years. There's still a, a reliance on a famous doctor in a large uh, hospital, uh, but just now uh, that they will be able, they are now being able to offer their services across the internet in a more efficient fashion. So when you've been navigating through this uh, you mm -hmm. have not uh, uh, hit mm -hmm. some significant barricades, so mm -hmm. was that pretty smooth go going yes, through very this, smooth. this process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was okay, able well, to get that's, that's, the that's good to hear. replacement mm -hmm. everything quite effectively. Yeah. Okay, so I I've I got to ask you a a lot of questions, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, would you like to add anything to our conversation? Mm -hmm. Uh, that you think that would be important for our international uh, audience? Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, I, I think 
uh, a lot of people who uh, are in the data science field or big data, so to speak, uh, lead people to think about a single centralized system, like a smart city uh, system without, I guess, smart citizens uh, and so on. But when we say smart uh, here in Taiwan, we really mean that the social innovators, the people closest to the pain, are smart. So the next time that you find that you're frustrated with your EMR or, or some other systems, remember that it is possible to design the system in a decentralized way, where maybe the insurance uh, record is still hosted by the national health insurance, but the interaction, the patterns in Taiwan, even the tax filing system uh, is co-designed uh, with the people who actually file the tax uh, themselves. It's always uh, easier to co-design with people close to the pain than overly relying on the central designer to anticipate the need uh, of the people. So work with the people, not just for the people, uh, would be my reminder to the fellow technologists. Well, that's that's amazing, and I think uh, we have uh, lessons to learn from uh, from Taiwan. Uh, for example, here, uh, the Arrive Can uh, app doesn't keep your information about vaccination. So every time you, <laughs> you come back to uh, to Canada, you have mm -hmm. to start from all over again. There is there is no information stored in the system. So it's mm -hmm. uh, it's really nice that uh, you've been able to do this for uh 20 20 plus uh, million people mm -hmm. so that's uh that's that's really remarkable thank you and taiwan can help so i, <laughs> <laughs> I will we we will uh, give them uh, your business card actually <laughs> so that i would i would like to thank you for your openness in the discussing all these uh, issues uh, related to uh mental health with respect to uh, the, the COVID crisis. And now you're actually handling all these uh, issues on the island of uh, Taiwan. And I'm very much uh, looking forward to uh, visiting uh, Taiwan uh, mm -hmm. again in the near future. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think we'll be able to go in, in June because the island may, may mm -hmm. still have a quarantine uh, in place. So. Uh, anyway, I'm looking forward to it, and I'd like to thank you on my behalf and on the behalf of, uh, of CINP for this uh, very nice conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we are uh, we could be ready now to move into the question period with uh, my other colleagues. Thank you, Minister Tang. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Thank you very much for the wonderful and impressive conversations. We learn a lot from the conversations. I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Minister Tao for your great suggestions for mental health. And I also thank the chair, uh, Professor Briel, for withdrawing the great suggestions from the genius. So uh, next, I'd like to move on to the second part, Q&A part. I'd like to take several questions from the participants. So first of all, uh, I'd like to ask Professor Zoha. Professor Zohar. Yes, uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, Minister. I would like to ask you about your vision for psychiatry, let's say, 20 years from now, vis-a-vis -vis the technology <laughs> changes that we are facing now. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I had a, a job description as a digital minister in 2016 uh, that I have written really a, a poem, a, a prayer, uh, although it talks about how to switch from a IT machine to machine uh, paradigm to a digital people to people paradigm. It works equally uh, as a vision for mental health in the digital age. So I'll simply recite my job description. It goes like this. Uh, when we see the internet of things, Let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, 
let's always remember the plurality is here. So the plurality is the vision. Okay, thank so you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Professor Osumi, you do have questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's, I'm very honored to be here online because I'm a big fan of uh, the, uh, Minister Tan. Um, actually, I have read your book and, uh, and also the uh, Audible. <laughs> and uh, so I like your idea of the starting from the very small thing. So uh, how you can uh, utilize your uh, kind of some non-profit type of organization like uh, radical change uh, can overcome mental health issue, in the, especially in the modern society. What is your idea? Yeah, uh, the idea of radical exchange uh, is to apply this paradigm of plurality on every sort of aspect of our everyday lives. For example, instead of one person, one vote, um, which may actually leave 49% um, um, or even 65% uh, feel disappointed after the election. Uh, we use plural voting uh, where people can allocate a budget of 99 voice points uh, uh, into the pairs of budgets, candidates, or whatever choices that has the most synergy among themselves. So that's plural voting for plural funding, also for the cases that they want to improve on their community, they can pull their resource together that doesn't suffer from the winner takes all of the grants model or the wealthy takes all, uh, gives all model of the uh, matching crowdfunding model and so on. So I believe uh, when applied uh, to uh, improving the mental health, the plural ideas of radical exchange cause for a community-oriented way of uh, health as a community where the structural issues affecting the community, it could be stigma, it could be a lot of different things, can be resolved through the crowdfunding of innovations like in Taiwan, a nonprofit called With Red crowdfunded um, the, I think, the paths, right, for uh, menstruation. Uh, Taiwan doesn't actually suffer that much from the lack of access, but we do suffer from stigma. And by crowdfunding quite publicly and asking all the mayors to um, agree to commit on providing free uh, period-related uh, materials and education in all the different levels of basic education, the stigma is resolved by what's ostensibly a crowdsourcing or crowdfunding uh, campaign and so on. So community action tools and the mechanism to facilitate such actions can accelerate the social change. So it's no longer about an individual anxiety about period, but rather about the entire community uh, destigmatization um, effort. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So how about Professor Yame Bai? Hi, Minister Aaron. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this session. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, for these years in Taiwan, we had uh, some uh, fortunate uh, event that uh, our uh, psychiatric patients, uh, they have the homicide event. So I want to ask your opinion, uh, can uh, the AI or the um, uh, IT can help uh, our physician or our psychiatrist to uh, establish the uh, society uh, safety network. Uh, yeah, I want to ask mm -hmm. your opinion. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of those early warning systems uh, that we're looking at now uh, focuses on empowering the people closest uh, to, to the uh, patients who are suffering. Uh, from a uh, different sort of um, first incongruence <laughs> uh, and then disorder and then full-fledged uh, acting out. So it's not just about um, detecting uh, when they're uh, on the later stages, but rather on building the preventative uh, networks on the first stages so they feel comfortable uh, talking to, as I mentioned, the peer counselors, the local community counselors, the social workers, and so on. But to do that, it means that the 
local workers need to be empowered with the same set of assistive intelligences that help them to work in a way that's much more personalized uh, than they currently have in their limited span of time. So there are many assistive intelligence teams, uh, especially through our presidential hackathon, which for every year, the president gives five trophy awards to the local team that solves a similar issue in their vicinity in a small community and then promise within a year uh, to scale it out to the entire country of 24 million people, right? So that's how we actually got uh, the telediagnosis, the telemedicine and the QR card uh, that's part of the national health insurance system. So the mental health focus of, I believe, the past year uh, was on empowering the social workers who previously uh, work only on what we call um, the case management for long-term healthcare uh, to nevertheless identify the connections of their cases in their families and so on because of the undue stress that they must feel uh, taking care of the long-term health care uh, patients and empowering the local psych psychiatrists and uh, social workers and mental health workers so that they're not in their own silos anymore but uh, could share a dashboard uh, that's of course still fully respecting of the privacy and human rights. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So about uh, Professor Min Chi Hua. Thank you, Professor Kida. Uh, thank you very much for um, uh, for Minister uh, Tan's and uh, Professor Flyer's conversation, uh, which really burdened my mind. Um, my questions might be a little bit push the boundary because you know BBC World News reported yesterday that a robot assisted surgical procedure might reduce uh, significantly the complications including the bleeding or the uh, healing wound the healing of wounds and uh, thereby to improve the prognosis but um, mm -hmm. what do you think about the, the future the robot uh, assisted uh, psychiatric psychiatric practice um, might be it might be a question out of track, but I really want to understand your perspective on this robot assisted practice. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, most of my time conversing with my French psychoanalyst uh, was through an iPad. So I know something about a robot standing <laughs> here for a psychiatrist. Uh, I believe uh, I also acted on that uh, wisdom. Uh, back in the days when I appear in the UN uh, Geneva meeting as a robot because my passport doesn't allow me to enter the UN building. Right? So it's applied knowledge. Um, but uh, in, in more seriousness, uh, I do believe that assistive technologies uh, should remain assistive, <laughs> not authoritarian. That is to say, uh, this is a assistive technology, right? Without which I can't see you very well, uh, but we don't debate about the ethics of the psychiatrist wearing glasses uh, when looking at their patients because we know fully that this eyeglass is um, transparently aligned to our best interests. Um, uh, evidence is that I'm not seeing a pop-up advertisement that I have to spend 10 seconds looking before closing it. So obviously it is aligned to my and my uh, communications best interest and is also accountable in the sense that if it's blurred, if it has bias and so on, I can mm -hmm. fix it myself by watching some DIY mm -hmm. videos on YouTube uh, or sending it to the repair person down the street. And we don't have to pay um, thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in licensing fees. We don't have to sign an NDA in order to repair our eyeglasses. Uh, and so because of that, there is no ethics uh, conversation about the use of eyeglasses uh, in psychiatry uh, sessions. Now. Um, in the old days when telescope, reflective telescope were first being invented, there really is a uh, philosophy of science debate on whether the use of telescope to discover uh, new astronomical bodies or new features of the planetary system, whether that counts as science or not. Um, because when Galileo and uh, those people first adopted these new assistive technologies, really there is no 
kind of alignment and accountability was a mystery uh, for most astronomers. So we're now moving uh, from a stage where the machine learning are something like Galileo's telescopes uh, to nowadays eyeglasses. Now, there are actually the physics is pretty much the same, right, between those two objects. What differs is uh, our acquaintance to the social norms and the technologist's uh, willingness to open up, as I mentioned in the very beginning, open source, uh, the blueprints of how those technologies are made. And when the blueprints are made open and when all the primary schoolers learning about data and digital competence can assemble their own telescopes, or in this case, machine learning models, uh, that's the point when we can then say, oh, it, it's just like wearing an eyeglasses. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So. Uh, Dr. Muhon Chen, the coordinator of this session, do you have a question? Uh, thank you, Professor Ikeda, and thank you, uh, Minister Tan. And I have one question. Uh, as you know, in the last day came many parents use the iPad or iPhone to raise uh, their children. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I want to hear your opinion how, t how parents may uh, optimally use the technology to raise the, their children. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess be there, right? Uh, share the iPad <laughs> with the kid, not leaving the kid to the iPad. <laughs> That's the, the first advice. It's common sense, but I still have to say it. Uh, and then the, the other thing is that um, uh, now I'm not working for uh, or with Apple anymore, so this is not a uh, product uh, placement, but I do believe uh, that Apple has put some thoughts into, for example, Apple Arcade, which are the kinds of games that does not encourage addictive behavior uh, simply because uh, they want to sell more uh, in-game purchases. Uh, they will show advertisement that leads into more in-game purchases and so on. It's a, what we call dark pattern. Uh, on the App Store, uh, but instead of a top-down way of saying that let's just ban all in-game uh, purchases uh, by minors, which would, uh, of course, lead to the minors using the adults' credit cards, <laughs> um, they instead they instead uh, devised this uh, subscription-based services, Apple Arcade, in which no advertisement or uh, income uh, in-game purchases are possible, and the subscription goes more fairly to the game experiences and so on. So uh, I would would not say that iPad solves uh, any of those parenting problems, actually introduce more problems, uh, but there are also parts in the ecosystem that are now more catering to the uh, mental health and the integrity of the family relationship. So use those. Uh, now, I'm not saying that uh, subscribe to Apple services, you can also subscribe <laughs> to any of those services, but sometimes if you don't uh, subscribe to a service that treats you as the customer, then your kid's attention become the product and the dark patterns uh, will come. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think there must be more questions, but the time is almost up. So uh, I'd like to, Pierre, to uh, summarize this uh, wonderful session, including the conversation part and the Q&A part. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, Dr. Pierre uh, kindly uh, included uh, questions from uh, Professor Kazuki Nakagome, uh, the uh, president of uh, the National Center of Neurology and Psychiatry in Japan, and also the Professor Atsumi Nika, uh, the, uh, one of the CNP counselors. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Briel. So could you summarize the, this session? That's an arduous task uh, to summarize uh, everything that we've discussed in the past hour, but uh, I think Minister Tang has really shown us the advantages of using this uh, technology uh, to bring perhaps uh, access to care that was not available before. I can tell you personally, I was very reluctant before the pandemic to use this technology, uh, but I think that there are so many advantages. And uh, the uh, example that you provided to us about the system that has been implemented with your help of course in in taiwan is uh, is just simply amazing and uh, should be available in in many other countries so i think you've you've convinced us the clinicians that there are advantages and 
And but uh, as prep as an old fashioned clinician, I think a hybrid <laughs> model is 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 probably uh, something that would be uh, optimal. <laughs> And, and you certainly you certainly emphasize that uh, in the in the in the question period uh, of people working together to be able to optimize uh, treatment and care of people. So thank you again for your availability and wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Professor. Uh, so thank you very much, Minister Tan, for. Uh, kindly answering many questions, um, mostly in the uh, field of mental health. Um, this was a great opportunity for the audience and the participants, including me. And, um, I hope Minister Tan will continuously support mental health research and clinic, especially by integ uh, inte uh, integrating digital technology. So thank you very much, Mr. Tan and all participants. And I close this special session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.